Welcome back, dear friends, to another segment of Through Different Eyes, a program that is dedicated to communicating God's way of seeing things and God's way of healing the broken heart. There's nothing like the peace and satisfaction that comes from remaining faithful to your post of duty, even in the midst of mistakes, failings, misunderstandings, struggles, people problems, particularly conflict. I love this story, one of my favorite stories about Private Ray Cote back in Germany with the 12th Infantry after World War II. During maneuvers, Pastor Cote was put on sentry duty to guard some pontoons on the banks of the Rhine River. But because of an oversight of his commanding officer, he wasn't relieved for six days. So he stayed on duty day and night, even when it rained heavily. Sympathetic farmers gave him food and milk, and when he was finally relieved and got back to his outfit, his commanding officer praised him for his strong sense of duty. But some of his buddies wisecracked that coat had a hole in his head. What kept Private Coat faithful? Here's what it was. He was totally committed to the cause for which he was serving. He would rather have died than disobey the general order that states to quit my post only when property relieved. The followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, you and me, dear friend, have been called to an even higher post of duty to faithfully carry out our heavenly commanding officer's assignment until properly relieved. The post of duty, the heavenly assignment, by faith establish an intimate, knowledgeable love affair with Jesus through diligent personal study and practice of his word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15 says this, and if you've got it in your Bibles, please turn there. And if not, write it down so you can look at this again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he, Christ, died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. Notice the change in loyalties. The love of Christ constrains us. He died for everyone because we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. And now that love moves us to no longer live for ourselves, but live for him who loved us and gave himself for us. Study to show thyself approved unto God, it tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15. You'll hear me share that again in a moment. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, accurately dissecting the word of truth, the word of God. You know, the result of this persistent faithfulness to this, this assignment to pursue an intimate, knowledgeable love affair with Christ, this post of duty that actually moves us to remain faithful as his witnesses wherever we're called, by the power of God's grace, there will be an ever-brightening, effectual communication of the truth about God's loving character, not only through our words, but through our lives. A picture of Christ that will influence others to personally embrace this incredible message, the last message to the world, the three angels' messages found in Revelation 14, 6-12. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, we read Christ's words. I'm reading from my notes now. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. While you're at your post of duty, Dan adds, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that you may be tried. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Commenting on these verses, that famous commentary, Acts of the Apostles 588, makes this statement. 
Looking down to the long centuries of darkness and superstition, the aged exile, the Apostle Paul, saw multitudes suffering martyrdom because of their love for the truth. But he saw also that he who sustained his early witnesses would not forsake his faithful followers during the centuries of persecution that they may pass through before the close of time. Unquote. This kind of faithfulness, faithful to the call of duty, the kind of faithfulness, the call to God, may cause some outside observers, friends, may cause some people who are watching us to consider that we have a hole in our head. But you know, it was that way with Jesus, and it will be that way with his followers. In fact, inspiration tells us in Fundamentals of Education, page 289, when we reach the standard that the Lord would have us to reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Like the Apostle Paul commented in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we are made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men just like Jesus. Now, knowing this, the question in our hearts must not be, what will other people think? But rather, the question must be, what does God think? Our mighty God, who gave His only begotten Son out of love for us while we were yet sinners to redeem us from the path of death. What does God think? recognizing that he would be facing more persecution and trouble as he continued proclaiming the truths of the gospel. The Apostle Paul, when he was leaving Asia to go to Jerusalem, made this courageous and empowering statement found in Acts 20, verse 24. I want you to see this one. Take the time to go to your Bible right now and check out Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, awesome chapter in Paul's life. And I'm looking at verse 24, Acts chapter 20. Here's the bold statement he made to his brothers. I'm reading now verse 24. But none of these things move me. All the things that he struggled, bonds and afflictions, none of these things move me, neither count I myself dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And then shortly before his demise, Paul penned these words to his beloved young friend and fellow disciple, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading actually now verses 7 and 8 and 12, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 12. And there Paul says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Do not be ashamed nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now I'm jumping down to verse 12. For the which cause, for the cause of the gospel, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Powerful, empowering words from the Apostle Paul, not only for young Timothy, but for us also. When Christ our Savior was here on earth, he was confronted with distractions and difficulties that were challenging to him finishing the assignment that God the Father had called him to complete. Things like unbelieving relatives, misunderstanding disciples, 
difficult religious leaders who were trying to destroy his ministry. And I'm certain there were other things also. But in spite of, of, of what appeared to be overwhelming odds against him, Christ held to his post of duty his mission of mercy which his Father in heaven had sent him to accomplish. In John chapter 4, verse 34, we read these words, Jesus' words. He says, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. Again, Jesus speaks in John 6, verse 38. For I came, not, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And praise God for his glory and power and love for us. Our Lord Jesus did complete the work of the Father. He did complete what God sent him to do, not only in his life, but also in his death. Listen closely, just in your imagination, hear Jesus hanging on the cross of Calvary, saying these words, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, it is finished. Even when desiring to be faithful and obedient to the end. Some may wonder, how does a person develop such powerful commitment and loyalty to God's cause? The commitment that will hold him faithful to his post of duty even in the face of rejection and persecution. The answer, we're back to where we started. The answer, by beholding, we become changed. The only way that we will ever receive the power from God, be in a position for the Holy Spirit to communicate His love and power of divine grace to us, is spending time beholding Christ through His Word, letting the Holy Spirit transform our hearts. Let me read it to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Here is a beautiful principle. It's a principle that I am choosing by faith to live by and practice in my life. It says there, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass, beholding the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is the only way. But if you think about that text, I'm beholding God's glory, beholding his character. And that is what places me, that's what will place you in a position for the Holy Spirit to actually infuse us with the very character and love and power and hope of Christ. Oh, please take that time. Desire of Ages. Page 439 reveals the amazing results, the amazing results of this daily beholding of Christ. Let me read it to you from Desire of Ages 439. Let the repenting sinner fix his eyes upon the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And by beholding, he becomes changed. His fear is turned to joy. His doubts are turned to hope. Gratitude springs up. The stony heart is broken. A tide of love sweeps into the soul. Christ is in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. When we see Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, working to save the lost, slighted, scorned, derided, driven from city to city till his mission was accomplished. When we behold him in Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood, and on the cross dying in agony, when we see this, self will no longer clamor to be recognized. We shall be willing to be anything or nothing, so that we may do heart service for the Master, we shall rejoice to bear the cross after Christ, to endure trial and shame and persecution for his dear sake. And I say, amen. How about you? 
Precious friends, Jesus is inviting you and me to humbly cooperate with the work of His Holy Spirit so that we can have imparted to us His courage and His fortitude, His faithfulness to the post of duty, the assignment to which He has called us. How? Again I say, by faith, choosing to set aside some time each day to com- contemplate the Master's life, contemplate His service, His sacrifice. Let your minds dwell upon the exemplifying experience of our faithful friend, Savior and Lord, and author of our faith, the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. We're instructed in God's Word in 2 Timothy 2.15, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I like that, don't you? I firmly believe that it is vital for us to make this priority in our lives, for it is through the word of God that the Holy Spirit brings transformation and power to our lives. I encourage you, dear friends, like the apostles, like Job. I encourage you, dear friends, like Job confessed in Job 23, 12, to esteem the words of God's mouth more than your necessary food, especially study the life of Christ. As inspiration encourages it, take us, take it point by point, and let the imagination grasp each scene of his earthly experience, especially the closing ones. And what will happen to us? As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, not only on the cross, but in his life, our confidence in him will be quickened, be more constant. Our love will be strengthened and quickened, and we shall be deeply imbued with his spirit and the power No fear, but love, sound mind, clear communication. And friends, as we're moved by the love of Christ to determinedly remain faithful to his call of Christian duty, God is going to use us in a powerful way to communicate the last message of mercy to this world, this last call to the world, a revelation of his character of love. I want to close with these encouraging words from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 437. They have been such a blessing to me, such an encouragement to me to remain faithful to my post of duty. Listen closely as I read. The mighty God of Israel is our God. In him we may trust. And if we obey his requirements, he will work for us in as signal a manner as he did for his ancient people. Everyone who seeks to follow the path of duty will at times be assailed by doubt and unbelief. The way will be sometimes so barred by obstacles apparently insurmountable as to dishearten those who will yield to discouragement. But God is saying to such... Go forward. Do your duty at any cost. The difficulties that seem so formidable that fill your soul with dread, listen to this, that fill your soul with dread, those difficulties will vanish as you move forward in the path of obedience, humbly trusting in God. I like that, don't you? And lest you grow weary and lose heart, dear friends, please think of Jesus. Keep going back and thinking about Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame for you and me, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God, working there for us to answer the enemy's accusations, working there and looking forward to coming again and taking us home ever to be with him. Therefore, dear friends, be strong and of good courage and go forward. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord, my God, your God, even this God, the mighty creator and redeemer, will be with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. God bless you, dear friends. Check out 1 Chronicles 28.20. This is the call of God for all of us 
not only Solomon. Courage 